Okay. So you, you heard a lot this morning about different types of omega-3s, different molecules, different levels of dosings, timings, etc. cetera. Uh, and we're, we're entering an era where, in fact, it turns out that these omega-3s are gonna be more powerful than just about any other molecule so far in terms of the different actions and uh, uh, preventing death and, and acting on regeneration. The very brief thing I showed you on diglyceride, I didn't show you a slide that if you look at different rodent models and many other compounds, for some reason, the diglyceride structure, two omega-3s on a glycerol backbone instead of usual three, provides about two to three times greater neuroprotection in rodent, different rodent models and any other kind of molecule. So there's lots of things happening. We're very excited. And uh, one thing I have to say, uh, Glenn, I owe you a formal apology because I wasn't used to the timer here in front. Don't and we worry. Actually, and we actually did cut off five minutes of specific <laughs> questions that should have That's gone specific. to Glenn. I guarantee you I'll make it up to everybody by talking too much later. Okay. So why don't we open up this unstructured session? Who wants to go first? There we go. Whoever shouts louder. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. a question I would have asked to Glenn if I had had an opportunity to do so at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what fraction of the dysautonomia, or whatever the word is, cases that you've looked at are preceded by a viral infection? Well, it's a very hard question to answer, but I would, I would venture to say about two-thirds are preceded by some event. A known viral infection or something else? Well, people get sick. So um, um, the Costa said diarrheal illness or fever. What we look at is people come in and say, I was fine until such and such, or I've always had this, and it got much worse after such and such. And the such and suches are often illnesses of some sort. Um, so I work in a, in a chronic Lyme clinic, and you see Lyme disease patients, they look just like the other patients. And I've consulted on the COVID clinic, and they look just like the Lyme patients. And then a week ago, I had a young woman who was fine until she got mono, and um, now she is not herself. And, um, and she's developing, rapidly developing, this dysautonomia syndrome. We're watching it grow kind of before our eyes as one system after another gets screwed up. She had low grade, always had low grade constipation and always had low grade depression. She didn't like, she's a girl with a straight A average but never liked school and skipped school all the time. And she's a compliant person. So she was clearly had some pre-morbid condition but suddenly had an illness and got worse. She had mono and got worse. So this obviously suggests that the, that the conditions, the viral infection or whatever, caused the dysautonomia. Is, is that your conclusion? My conclusion is that the immune overreaction yeah. to the viral illness causes the dysautonomia. And, um, and not, the, not the virus itself, because all these viruses are very different in their interactions. Right. But you get this final common pathway of autonomic dysregulation. And there's a, also often an accompanying peripheral neuropathy that you can see with skin biopsy. So I think that, I think that what happens is you get a viral illness and then if you're the right person with the sodium channel vulnerability or a genetic tendency to over metabolize your lipids or some other thing, that you're gonna be one of the people who develops this overactivation of sympathetic nervous system, immune system, depletion of dopamine activity in your brain and gets into a cycle of increasing dysfunction that you can, surprisingly, people, when I get them better on drugs, they don't stay better unless they stay on the drugs. So there are a group of people who get this, who get better spontaneously. If it lasts longer than two years, 
most likely you're going to have to stay on medicine. But before that, if I give you drugs and you get better, at two years I sometimes can take you off the drugs and you'll do fine. The so, other people so, though tend to stay with So it's got I'm all gonna, these different facets. I'm going to suggest that we uh, can go I, on to another it, topic because we can do this at lunch and uh, we won't have enough time if just we do that. But there may be other kind of questions that, for your five minutes. There was a, there was a question there. Uh, for the DHA... Can you please uh, give your name first? Uh, uh, it's M I'm Michael Dansu. Uh, <laughs> I have a quick question on the DHA and spinal cord studies. Are there possible synergistic effects with EPA, with simultaneous uh, administration? Yeah, th this is uh, an excellent question. We have also published a, a small study we did with EPA only. And we did see some protective effects. This was just a very limited study we did uh, with EPA. And we didn't pursue this extensive characterization of the profile of, of EPA in spinal cord injury as, as we did with DHA. EPA is quite different from DHA. In terms of generating very rich family of SPMs, there is no doubt it's a very exciting molecule. But in, in, from other perspectives, we still don't fully understand um, some facets of what EPA does in the central nervous system. Um, we have never injected DHA combined with EPA. So um, I, I would um, reserve judgment. I, I don't know uh, if it would have the same efficacy. It certainly activates in terms of receptors, for example, some of the targets that could be relevant because uh, DHA binds to retinoid receptors, RXRs, which are, can homodimerize or heterodimerize with PPAR receptors, and EPA can also bind to PPAR receptors, which are involved in the neuroinflammatory response. So, um, yes, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's a story that may be quite interesting to pursue. Uh, and, and um, yeah, and it's <coughs> it has. because. Uh, DHA, in, in addition to being a functional fatty acid, is also a structural fatty acid. 50% of the retina is DHA. Yeah. And uh, we've done both. And in triglycerides, EPA doesn't work, and the triglyceride it works. But the other thing about EPA that may be important in a lot of the conditions we're talking about is there's mood, depression, uh, suicide, uh, it's associated with, and EPA has been shown to be much more effective than DHA in prevention of bad moods, suicide disorders, depression, etc. So maybe their combination has some kind of interaction in these kind of t conditions we're talking about that may be helpful long term. <coughs> um, this is Mark Lupa. Um, I'm, I'll preface this by saying I'm not an expert in this. Um, it might be a silly question, but, you know, omega-3 and DHA has been around for so long, and you can buy it at almost any nutraceutical store. And a lot of people have taken it, but sub, certain subpopulations have been taking quite a bit of it. And so I'm just, and, and yet, and I presume there have been done some, uh, some studies uh, in order to look at the things that you've been looking at. I, I don't think that I've ever seen such striking results. And I'm just wondering, what, what, do you, what is the difference? Is it, is it a, a formulation question? Is it the, um, the route of administration? Is it a, a dosage? Uh, or is it just better experimentation that, that has uh, gotten to this point? Yes, that's, that's a very good question. In fact, uh, what you are implying in a way is saying, well, many people around the world are taking some capsules of fish oil, and maybe there have been studies giving people some fish oil. Um, and um, so how come that this hasn't been shown? Now, when you inject DHA in, in the peripheral compartment through intravenous access, you have a completely different pharmacokinetics and you have access, um, especially through a disrupted blood-brain barrier, which happens after neurological injury, to many receptor targets that you can activate directly and immediately. 
And that is why uh, we always do in our group intravenous studies, because they are relevant, they are easy to implement uh, by em emergency teams, for example, if they want to inject DHA. So I think there is a problem of access of critical targets in a timely manner. Uh, whereas if you uh, take DHA as capsules, and it depends on the level of supplementation, and that's another discussion we can have, um, most people don't take enough anyway because uh, a large fraction of the Western population is in a state of omega-3 relative depletion compared to the, what they should be at. And, um, and this is another story. I don't want to digress, but maybe we can come back to it. But um, just taking um, fish oil capsules, uh, a moderate dose, will gradually in, enrich your membranes and cells and circulating cells, the leukocytes, as much as in, in, in tissues. But this is completely different from the dynamics of the effect when you inject the drug after an injury. Completely different in terms of access of targets to a, a ligand. And I, I think I, I showed a slide about we can do it in minutes rather than weeks with an injection. I think, Rurong, you had, did you have a point? Uh, yeah, and I, and I just want to you know, follow up, you know, certainly in, uh, in uh, DHA, EPA, you know, omega-3 you know, have been there for, for, for a long time. You know, and uh, and uh, the, the clinical trial result probably not, you know, not very you know, uh, uh, convincing, right? Maybe you now we need to identify you know, specific, uh, specific you know, conditions, right? And now, in the, as I mentioned, in the, in the DHA and the fish oil with, with SPM, right? Certainly, you know, those products are much more expensive, right? And uh, in general, you know, they may have in you know, a slightly you know, better effect, right? If you can afford, right? Many of you may be able to, you know, but we, we, we still lack of you know, a, a clinical uh, evidence. Another thing that I'm thinking you know, is you know, your lifestyle is important. When you take fish oil, if you do exercise, because you know, and as, as we know, you know that you know, in the autonomic and you know, the dysregulation, right? But the exercise and you know, the breathing, right, will help in you know, a balance and you know, autonomic and you know, function. At the same time, if you take in you know, a fish oil DHA, it you know, may help in you know, a conversion, more effective conversion you know, to SPM. And in that case, you know, you may have you know, more, you know, more benefits, right? But I know you know that. Uh, in a, in a surgery, you know, right? So theoretically, if you have in a trauma and a procedure, you, know, you take, you know, but, uh, but uh, your doctors will, will, will argue against this because, you know, you know we're causing a broader thing, right? You're not supposed to take, uh, you know, take fish oil, right? But otherwise, it may, may help, you know, and, uh, and uh, speed your recovery you know, after a surgery and an insert. I would say, you know, DHA, EPA, maybe you know, the most effective in the time window is you know, in that time window, right? So that's a perisurgical in the area where you have a lot of you know, information, I think. Uh, but uh, in the clinic phase, it can be you know, much less effective. It, maybe it's time dependent. Yeah. Uh, Larry again. Uh, so, uh, yeah. It's on. Uh, so Maybe for Scott and Glenn, as opposed to focus for the moment on DHA and uh, as we are a little bit, it's fine. I, I want to ask whether either of you has ever thought for pain reduction, because I can't remember your big slide of all the things you tried that failed with this one patient and the six that you that worked. Did you ever try? the anti-transplant um, rejection drugs to, as a way of diminishing the immune reaction. Yeah, so we do. We've, so we've used, uh, again, I, have, I collaborate with a, with a uh, rheumatologist for those patients. We've given people, if it exists, we've given it to somebody for their immune system. Um, what's interesting is, again, we're still in the dark, so we don't know which drug to give. So we have some patients who have some markers and we give them biologics. Tumor necrosis factor, inhibitors, other things. We've seen a lot of our patients have had trials of hydroxychloroquine and methotrexate because they're really benign things to do and some of them get way better. And one, one of the patients, so I noticed Atsuka is one of our sponsors, 
One of my patients worked with Otsuka, and she had a dramatic response to hydroxychloroquine. And, and it, it's, it was astounding to her. Um, so sometimes those drugs work phenomenally well, Cytaxan and, and, um, and uh, mycophenolate. We, we use them, but we use them only if we're really convinced that it's mostly immune because they, neuromodulators, the nice thing about them, you stop them and they go away. Immunomodulators, you stop them and the immune system doesn't always go back to where it was. Um, and so you, I worry about that with patients and tell them that we try neuromodulators first unless I'm really convinced. But I don't know what the right thing to do is. Scott? Um, <clears throat> no, I, I don't have personal experience with neuropathic pain and uh, those type of drugs. However, uh, as we've discussed before with our proteomics and so forth, that there does appear to be an autoimmune response going on in the injured spinal cord. We, we have analyzed this tissue yeah. um, a year out, 20 years out, 40 years out. Mm -hmm. And when, when, you, when you look at the proteomics, it's very consistent with uh, markers you see in other immune states, whether or not it be lupus, yeah. uh, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid sure. arthritis, and yeah. so forth. Yeah. So I was interested when, yeah. when you said uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine and other things like that. Those are things I, we had actually talked about in our group yep. for neuropathic pain. Right. Because uh, something uh, with the initial injury, even if it's peripheral nerve, it's all happening from my perspective, in my research, at the central processing areas that become hyperactive. Why do they become hyperactive and stay so year after year after year? And then I'll watch this front ascend the cord and descend the cord. One area dies out, then the next area becomes hyperactive. We can actually track this. And then uh, it looks like, uh, to me, uh, that it's, it's an autoimmune response at some level. Yeah. So, Scott. Um, you had one slide where you went from the spinal cord and you went up to the brain. And when it go, so how does it get to the brain? Does it creep along the other part of the nerve pathway or is it a humoral response? You mean, you mean how does the pain get how, to the brain? How does the brain get changed in terms of its sympathetic centers? Oh, oh uh, after the surgery, yeah. Why does the connectivity change? Um, <clears throat> well, it, it um it seems to be uh, um, a sympathetic, uh, mediate, uh, sympathetic response uh, at some point after the injury. There has to be some rewiring of the circuitry after the injury that's now bringing in the sympathetic nervous system. I think at the level of the intermediate lateral cell column of the spinal cord, the dorsal gray and the intermediate lateral cell column are, are, are very close and you get the C fiber sprouting and a new circuit develops uh, after the injury that allows for the dorsal gray matter to feed into the sympathetic chain. And we, we don't know where all the, the sympathetic fibers come in. When, when I talk to neuroanatomists all the time, it, it's hard to track. They're, they're mostly C fibers. How do you track the afferents coming into the cord up, uh, you know, up into the brain and so forth? So it, it's a hard question, but it, it seems to incorporate the sympathetic nervous system in then uh, <clears throat> that feedback into the brain seems to um, shut down communication between sympathetic centers. I, I saw some slides that you know, showed the insula, amygdala, anterior, anterior cingulate cor cortex, medial prefrontal cortex. I don't remember whose, maybe it was your, your slides. slides. Yeah, your slides. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah we were showing um, <clears throat> how that talk between those areas and the somatosensory cortex um, uh, were shut down in the pain state. And then uh, after we eradicated the pain in these patients, they started talking to each other again. And so um, that, that's, I mean, the sympathetics are involved. Exactly uh, how it gets there, um, I, I, I can only guess that it's, it's a redevelopment of the circuitry from the, the dorsal gray hyperactive mm -hmm. regions. I'm thinking it, it, it involves the intermediate lateral cell column, sympathetic chain, I know at some level, and, gets back up there. I, I guess I didn't answer that very well. But. <laughs> well, it's a big question. Well, we have a lot of questions. Yeah, I have one from the, audience, from the online audience. Please. Uh, so this question, and I'm going to elaborate on it a little bit. The question is, do omega-3s interact with non-receptor proteins to modulate their activity? 
and I think we can generalize that a little bit. One of the things I was surprised to discover as talking with Bob Murphy some years ago was that there are more biologically active lipids than there are proteins. There's tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of them. We don't really understand their metabolism very well. It's hard to even write them down in coherent ways. Um, so could you talk a little bit about the enzymatic pathways and the regulation and sort of the broader context of what we know and don't know about fatty acid regulation? So in actually, you know, you know, that's very important you know, because there are more, more, more in you know, lipids right, than proteins. And now, now we know you know, many uh, diseases are associated with uh, lipid dysregulation, right? even, even diabetes. Now people think there is more evidence that this is lipid dysregulation you know, versus you know, glucose, right? Because, uh, and, uh, and uh, we know, you know that for sure at high concentration, they can interact them because these are lipids, right? And your, your, your cell membrane is <laughs> basically a lipid, right? And when you have high concentration, they can interact you know, with, uh, for example, ion channels, right? And, and, and as Adina mentioned, the potassium channels, and, and we also sh show, you know, the trip channels, right? So that they, they can, in that you know, lipid raft in a local envir environment, they can direct and you know, regulate, you know, these ion channels, their distribution, you know, their function, you know, therefore. And then, of course, you have in you know, a specific in you know, surface receptors, right, GPCRs. Then these lipids can also go inside. They have nuclear receptors, right? So that they, they can interact with mitochondria and boost your energy and production. So, so there, are, there are many pathways that we still don't know much about you know, that, yeah. But I, I think it's an exciting time in that what we're doing in our different labs, we hope that next year we'll be able to come with more specific answers, redose, reroute, and which type? And there's another question here. Well, mine's more of a generic kind of a follow-up. Can you state your name, please? Uh, Christopher Lundy. Um, uh, name? Tacking off the gentleman uh, <laughs> up, up the stairs there. It's just, um, maybe this is um, for a panel next year, but it was kind of like look for Alzheimer's and dementia. And I know like there's a medication, Aricept, and that's maybe to help uh, oxygenation of the brain. And I was just wondering what, what the future might hold in that regard as far as the, cog the cognitive aspects, because most people are taking the, you know, the alpha lipoic acids for the, the brain cognition, the DHA. And so I was just wondering if you know, whatever kind of you know, layman's comments we might want to have in that regard. Um, so again, thank you very much. So I've got an answer, but a you, one of you like to take it up? Was, was, um, the cognitive is, aspects, I guess. Is, is your question more focused on uh, the potential role of these fatty acids in neurodegeneration and in diseases like dementia and the, the changes in cognition you see in dementia? Do, do I understand that correctly? Um, again, I think um, the field was started with, with over-enthusiasm because if you look at the brain of Alzheimer's patients, there are changes in lipids which are significant in a variety of lipids. And there is certainly a loss in DHA uh, specifically. Um, we don't fully understand why that happens. There are three, four possible causes. And there have been attempts to address this um, by providing moderate doses of DHA uh, to uh, people with uh, dementia, but I, I, I don't think there has been any resounding success with that. Because I, I think, again, it's a question of remembering the complexity of the human context versus studies which are maybe uh, suggesting potential in lower species. In, in Alzheimer's disease, I think we are still far from understanding um, what happens over 15 or 20 years, which is silent, and then becomes apparent in the prodromal phase, in the um, mild cognitive yeah. impairment, and then. But um, we're, yeah. So, so uh, when uh, when the diagnosis is made, um, and you give people a moderate dose of, of, of DHA or DHA plus EPA in a standard fish fish oil capsule, uh, I don't think that is enough to see a significant uh, impair, uh, improvement in in cognition. Although some animal studies, I think we, we rather simplistic models. Um, uh, suggest that there might be scope for that, um, but yeah. the, but but uh, there is certainly uh, an importance of of DHA and EPA for normal cognition because they have important structural roles. So 
um, when you deplete, when you create a, a state which you can do genetically or through dietary manipulation, if you take a, a rodent, again, regressing a bit to, to perhaps lower species with less complex brains, um, if you create a state of depletion of omega-3 fatty acids and you do cognitive tests, you see there is a poorer performance. The opposite is true. Uh, Zhang Kang created this miraculous little mouse called the Fat One Mouse with high levels of omega-3 fatty acids uh, in, in, in the body. Uh, and if you look at the performance of these animals, they seem smarter. So th there is some indication that being what I would call omega-3 adequate, at least <coughs> adequate, so not well, being a... Uh, no, but I can add that we've published, actually, yeah. in using neonatal models of hypoxia ischemia, like around delivery called hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy models, that if you give, treat them after the injury, just after, with the omega-3 injections, that when they grow up to be adult mice, they actually have a normal function. So, and which includes cognitive function tests. So we've, we've published on that. And I'll ask one last question because according to the timer, we're over wow. <laughs> uh, to Glenn. In your experience with these multiple inputs to chronic pain, when it's treated, in the, the ones that affect cognitive function, how much does the cognitive function improve? They go back to baseline, but it takes a long time. So um, the brain fog is the last thing to go away, um, and it takes, it takes months for that to really get back to baseline. People have to be patient with that part. Um, but they all have, my patients all have created brain fog. A subset of people with familial um, dysautonomia and have cognitive complaints get better when you give them high doses of niacin via true niacin, really? which is a, a B3 vitamin go, made, made into NAD, the pathways yeah. to NAD. And I think it helps their neurons work better in that group of people. So occasionally I'll have a patient where I give them true niogen and they have a miraculous result, but it's not most people, it's just some people. But I like that because it's, B3 is pretty benign. So okay. well, more, more on B3 next year. So great. <laughs> so I, w I would like to thank Larry and the organizers for allowing us to be a bit of a pain. I'm originally a gastroenterologist, so you can pick your location, a pain. And uh, I want to thank the speakers, and I want to thank all of you for a special session.